Okay. Uh, up next is Simon Dehan. Uh, great developer, great guy, um, helpful, handsome. Um, <laughs> works for the Precal Foundation, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, twisted and cool twisted stuff. Simon, thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, my my talks about scalable event-driven architectures with with twisted. Who's actually done any twisted dev here? Cool, excellent. Okay, so I'm not going to go extremely deep into twisted, um, but I'm going to go into enough detail that I think you guys will be comfortable to get uh, up and running with with twisted yourselves and at least grab uh, grasp some of the concepts and um, you know that, that make make twisted. Um, yeah, and questions at the end. Um, if there's some extremely difficult questions, I'm more than happy to to answer them. Uh, it might be that I'm going to give you a deferred, and uh, we'll get back to it later. Uh, so yeah. So all right. So I I work for the Precal Foundation. Mission statement of the Precal Foundation is to build open source, scalable mobile technologies and solutions to improve the health and well-being of people living in poverty. Um, who's not heard of the Precalc Foundation before? Or who hasn't heard us speak? Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, I guess we're one of the sponsors, so that kind of makes sense. But um, So yeah, this is what we do, and this is what we focus on. We focus on the majority world. Um, so it's, it's probably the most interesting place to work uh, and to live in. Um, and I'm speaking out of experience. I'm, I'm originally from Holland, but I absolutely love living in South Africa and doing the work we do. Um, and there's some, some really big challenges um, in across the majority world. And especially in Africa, it's an incredibly fascinating continent, um, but some, some major challenges. So there's 1 billion people, 700 million phones, and it's counting. Um, who knows how many countries there are in, in Africa, in the African continent? 54 since North and South Sudan split. And there's, according to Wikipedia, 2,100 active spoken languages. So there's, there's some massive challenges in across Africa, but also an incredible opportunity, especially looking at like 700 million phones. So that's close to, well, almost everyone in the African continent is reachable via a mobile phone. And with our statement, uh, mission statement to Im improve the lives of people living in poverty, we focus on on using this uh, device, the mobile phone. And um, the reality is that most people in Africa, most of them will never use a computer. So it's, it's not that they're, they're swapping a desktop for a mobile phone, it's, it's that the mobile phone is their primary device to communicate with the larger world. And as a result of this, mo mobile phones are, are much more important in the majority in developing countries than, it is than they are in developed markets. So um, we, we focus on Primarily the, the billion in Africa, first of all, uh, and beyond that, the other developing um, countries. And um, we focus on mobile phones because we think it's the, it's the tool to, to have an impact. Now, the areas we focus on are education, health, employment, agriculture, and governance. So what, what we're about is delivering potentially life-saving information to the target audiences living in, these, in, in the majority world in these areas. So these are areas of focus. And trust me, I'll, I'll get too twisted, but I'm just explaining what we do and why twisted is, is a good solution to, to, to the things we're trying to do. So in, in what we do, there are some, some really, really serious challenges. So this is a guy who, who set up a little shop, probably on the side of the road somewhere, and all he does is he charges cell phones. Um, and that's his... Uh, his, his means of income. And it shows that how important cell phones are for, well, not only for us, but for everyone across Africa. But also that there are some major challenges. So in terms of infrastructure, in terms of power, um, all of us, who, who here does not have a smartphone? Nice. <laughs> who here, um, okay, let's define a little bit more has a phone that only does like SMS and voice. A few. Cool. All right. I'm going to need you guys in a bit. Um, 
because those phones are, are, are the phones of our target audience. Um, it's, it's people who, who love their old, old monochrome Nokias, old Motorola's, primarily because the battery life in those things is amazing. And people at home don't have facilities to charge their phones. So if you have a fancy phone that dies after a day because the battery is being eaten by Bluetooth or some Java app, um, you'd much rather have a, a low-end old phone that actually lasts a couple of days. So coming back to um, some of the challenges, with the stuff we do and the projects we, we, we run, we, we sort of come to the conclusion that nothing is really reliable, especially when it comes to networks, especially when it comes to delivering content for mobile phones. So there are constant API changes. For some reason, people on well, the networks we integrate with across Africa love changing their APIs without telling us. Um, they, they almost turn into a sport. Other than that, there's some crazy API implementations where you're like, R really, was this, was this the best you could come up with? Um, but it's, it's what we have to work with. Other practical problems we have is um, power cuts in countries. And then people running their, for example, their SMS aggregators off of a diesel generator, but then forgetting to buy diesel. And as a result, your aggregator and your only connection into the country goes offline because, well, there's no more diesel. So next morning, people f fill up the generator, things get going again, and your, your message queues clear. So other than that, um, yeah, there's, there's really not all that much to be surprised about when we're doing this. We've, there's even been like companies disappearing where we're like, we thought you were sending messages for us, but we can't reach your host, we can't reach you. What actually happened, we don't know. So nothing is, is really um, reliable in, in, in the work we're trying to do in terms of integrating into different networks um, in order to get connectivity to mobile phones. The other problem is a problem we had on our own side, and that was in our applications, the stuff we did, the, the, the projects we ran, there was a very tight coupling um, between the actual app that we want to do, so the actual logic that drove the, uh, the applications, um, and the means of delivery. So how do we get that message out there? Um, and that wasn't a problem that was forced on us by the networks. That was just how we designed things, and that turned out to be uh, a fairly poor decision. Um, because as a result, uh, reuse of our applications became really difficult, and horizontally scaling our stuff became difficult as well. So with these two things in mind, nothing is reliable, and tight coupling for the work we do is a really bad idea. We, uh, we sort of started from scratch, and that's Vumi. And um, so Vumi means to roar. I don't remember in what language, but in case you're wondering, that's what it means. Um, and it, it really came out of us sort of being sick of reinventing a lot of wheels, speci specifically trying to integrate into different networks. So we thought, let's fix this once and for all. Let's build a proper messaging solution for these billion people across Africa, for these 700 million phones and other emerging markets, so that we take away the pain of integrating uh, into these countries and actually start hopefully start delivering reliable messaging for these countries, even though the infrastructure is really immature and crappy and very uh, error prone. Um, so this, when we started with this, that it, it, um, we, we just had some guiding principles. And some of these are, these are the main ones, I think, is that the, the means of delivery should be decoupled from how the application actually works. So they should be completely separate things. Um, the messaging between the, the application and how it's delivered should be asynchronous. There should be a standardized message format. And both the, the transports, how we deliver stuff, and the actual application should be reusable. So that if our partner for some reason disappears because not only didn't he fill up his diesel generator, but actually someone stole his generator and now he's out of business, we need to isolate ourselves from that problem. So we needed to say, okay, well, we've written an integration point for you, but we need to swap you out for something else as soon as that happens. In the same way, we've run some applications in, in a number of countries that we said, okay, we've, we've built this application logic, but we want to now integrate into the different country. And the original country we started with the protocol was, I don't know, CSV over some HTTP. And now the protocol thing we're doing is XML RPC-ish um, thing. 
So we wanted our applications to be completely isolated from those uh, uh, peculiarities of how we actually deliver the messages to the networks. So that's why we standardized our internal message format. And our applications just assume s from somewhere a message is going to arrive. And um, it's going to have these and these properties. And we can generate a reply and send it back. So we originally, we, are a, we have a strong background in, in developing Django applications. And um, we had a fair amount of Django in old, old, old revisions of Vimy. Turned out that Django's view of the world in terms of content publishing was a very, very bad fit when you're actually trying to stream messages as fast as possible. So that was out, and um, Twisted came in. So this is what our stack looks like now. Twisted for networking, which is basically also our application layer. RabbitMQ for the message bus. Has anyone used RabbitMQ? For anything other than like Celery or something like that? Yep, cool. Um, and then. Below that is our persistence layer, and that's Redis and React. Any other React users? The React ambassador. ambassador. Cool. Anyway, so this is our, our core stack. There's some other stuff we use, but, but these are our main building blocks. Um, and in terms of Twisted, I'm sure you guys are all know, Twisted is probably the oldest of these, but Node seems to be getting a lot of uh, favorable press lately. Um, so, Twisted is to Python, what Node is to JavaScript, what Event Machine is to Ruby. Any Ruby hackers here? Anyone done any Event Machine stuff? No? Wow. Okay, cool. So, event-driven programming basically means that, and all of these are event-driven programming frameworks, I suppose, and it just means that programs consist of callbacks that are called by the framework. Um, which, which is a really fantastic model, especially if your language allows for um, elaborate anonymous functions as statements. So going back to Node as an example, here's an HTTP server written in JavaScript for Node. And it's, it works really well, because basically you, you have a function that is expecting a callback. So there's HTTP create server, something that I need to call whenever uh, a request comes in, and then you give it an anonymous function which says, for this request, that response, write this thing to the response. And then for every single request that comes in, that whole statement is executed. So if your languages uh, support those types of functions, it works amazingly well. You just pass it in, forget about it. After a while, you, this starts looking like spaghetti, but that's beyond this slide. Um, Ruby um, works with blocks. So this, I think, is a client sending something to, a requ to a, another server. I'm not quite sure, but what we need to look at is here. Um, so here we're creating an HTTP client. You got your callback, and you give it a block. Now, I've done a fair amount of um, Ruby programming, and I really, really like Python. But the thing I miss about Ruby is being able to just throw around blocks as bits of code, do this when that happens. So this is exactly that. It's a callback. Whenever the callback fires, just um, run that bit of code. And it's incredibly convenient because, well, everything that happens later is still in the code that you're writing. So you can understand it, and you don't have to look elsewhere to see, OK, whenever this request comes in, do this bit of code. It's, it's, it's very readable. And so um, from a uh, while you're developing, it's easy to keep a mental model. Now, in Python, these are anonymous functions. The, there are reasons why the anonymous functions are limited to uh, one-line expressions. I don't quite want to go into that now. But So when using Twisted, we don't have the luxury of these anonymous functions that allow, well, like we were just looking at now with JavaScript and, and Ruby. Um, so Twisted's answer is, a deferred, which in other languages or frameworks is called a future or a promise. Has anyone heard of futures or promises before? From what languages? Like, or frameworks? Yeah, whatever. I, I thought Event Machine also worked with deferreds. Uh, event Machine is all, all over the place. Okay. 
Um, so it's a deferred. And a deferred is basically a value that isn't com computed yet. So in a way, a promise is a better word for a deferred. Um, so it, it can be passed around like a regular object, but it can't be asked for its value. And um, deferreds have callback chains, and the resu result of each callback is uh, would be the input for the next um, callback that you attach. So um, you basically chain your callbacks, and the value is passed on. Now, what this looks like is you have a function that you want to use as your callback, and here you have a a deferred from a a function that gets something from the network. So you're doing I/O, um, and you don't really want to wait on that. So this thing, this function internally says, "Okay, I understand what you want to do. Here's a deferred in the meantime that you can attach your callbacks to, and whenever I'm done with what I need to do over the network, I'll I'll fire that callback on that deferred, and you'll get the result." So basically, this is a promise of some data that will eventually arrive, but you're not quite sure when. So since you have a, a deferred, which is a reference to a, a not yet um, uh, computated value, but you can still work with it, the process can continue and start working on other um, requests as they come in, and it'll fire uh, the, the callbacks on those deferreds as soon as the data arrives. So here we're, we've got a deferred, and we're saying add, or add callback, print data, you refer to the function, the function gets the data that is eventually returned from get, get data from network function and just prints it. Now this is a fairly useless example, but it just shows how it works. Now deferreds, I guess I could have added that, but deferreds also allow for add errorbacks. So if something wrong happens or an exception is raised in here, the errorback is, uh, is called. So it's, um, it works really well, but when you add a lot of callbacks, the, the code can start Start to be will start to get fairly complicated and hard to understand and follow, and so there, even though Python doesn't have as elaborate um, anonymous function statements, there is a better way to write simple non-blocking tasks in, in Twisted. So, but it starts with um, was that for me? No, okay. I still have 15 minutes. So, um, so it starts with looking at a generator. Who doesn't know generators? Python generators, everyone does. Oh, you do? You don't? OK, cool. So Python generator is probably one of my favorite Python things. Um, it loops, and every time it's, it hits a yield statement. So you, a generator is created when you use the yield statement. Simple explanation, but I'm sure there's better explanations for it. But um, whenever, you, whenever it comes across yield, it suspends the um, execution of that function, and it uh, produces the value, in this case, n. So um, this is basically just a counter. You give it a countdown and until whenever a countdown uh, hits zero, it just stops, and it says um, done counting. So the cool thing is, as soon as it's released and then you iterate through it again, it, it continues where it, left off, where it left off. So it's, it suspends execution. You hit next, it continues where it, where it left off and then starts at the top again. So it's like a, it's a loop you can pause in a way. Now, Python has, allows for generators um, to become an expression, which means you can send a value back into a generator. So what this essentially does is it turns your generator into something of a code routine. And, um, What's his name? David David Beasley? Is that his last name? I don't know how you pronounce it. But uh, he's got a really cool presentation online. You should look it up on, on Python and coroutines that explains how this works. But what happens is that using the inline callbacks decorator that Twisted has, whenever you hit yield, it produces the deferred. And then whenever that deferred callback fires, so when the data comes back from the network, it resumes the operation of this generator it inserts the value that the deferred came back with, and you can store it as a local variable and then print the data. So what this allows you to do is um, you can write asynchronous non-blocking um, I.O. code while still writing procedural code that you can fairly easily wrap your head around. Now, there are definite like, drawbacks to writing your code like this, but when you're getting started with Twisted 
and you're still sort of like trying to get used to the whole concept of uh, of deferreds and asynchronous non-blocking code, this is a really great way to, to get started. So Twisted works around, uh, is built around the, the reactor pattern. And I've, I've drawn a number of drawings trying to, uh, that hopefully explains how the reactor pattern works, but this was my best one. Um, so these are your deferreds. W is for waiting, F is for fired, R is for ready. So while you're writing and your, your code is producing deferreds, which are basically promises of something that's about to happen, but you're not quite sure when it happens because it depends on, I don't know, how fast your disks are or how fast your, your, your network is, latency and whatnot. All you know is that eventually a deferred will, fall, will fire with the data that um, is coming back. So the reactor loop, constantly is looking at um, which events are, are ready to be processed. And the operating system notifies the reactor of this thing is ready, there's data on this socket, this file has been found. And so OS events shift the state of a deferred and basically says this, this deferred is now ready, there's data for it, so fire its callback chain. When that does, say this one has been fired and the callbacks that have been attached to your deferred can themselves again schedule new deferreds that need to be um, need to be handled. So as soon as this one's fired, all of the callbacks are done. It continues, and then um, it goes to the next ready one. So there is no waiting on the side of there's no no in that sense no threads or anything that are waiting for something to happen. It's just events that are fired and processes that are notified of changes and then callbacks are fired as a result. Is I'm sure there's going to be questions on this later, but cool. So just coming back to our um, the challenges we had, originally our, our applications were uh, very coupled and this was pre-twisted. Pre we had hard coupled, non-event driven setup where our transport was, was a hard coded part of our application which made it impossible to scale horizontally because how do you add new transports that you want to deliver to different countries to? So the first thing we did was decouple it, which meant our transports became a completely separate bit of code from how our applications worked. <laughs> from then on, we started using um, Twisted, which meant our transports and our applications now could start handling concurrent requests, um, which gave us a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, throughput because if we're dealing with an HTTP API and we want to send, um, I don't know, 10 messages a second or whatever, um, using a single transport, it would just all be serial. Now with Twisted, we can fire off a bunch of requests. All of those are deferreds. Whenever they're done, they're done and the callbacks are fired and, and now we can do uh, a bunch of concurrent requests. So we can seriously increase our throughput. Now, what I'm also hoping to show you is that how Twisted, in order to get to a really scalable architecture, what sort of ecosystem Twisted, or in our case, in what sort of ecosystem Twisted really shines for us. And that is around um, RabbitMQ. So um, here are all our transports that are, have been extracted, uh, abstracted, um, and our applications and all of the messages are standardized as soon as they come from the networks into an internal format that we can work with. RabbitMQ queues and routes them to the appropriate applications. Applications, all they care about is we receive a message, it's a bit of JSON, and um, um, the application responds to it. The message has all of the data that's, ne that's needed for routing, goes back through RabbitMQ, and it goes out through um, the application again. So in terms of our guiding principles, it's completely decoupled. All of the network trouble is isolated as far to the edges, well, and the integration trouble is isolated as far to the edges as possible. Um, we have an internal message format that we work with. Um, so the message that comes out of here is completely the same as the message that comes out of here, except it's got a different name and, and different transport type attached and whatnot. And we use all that data for, for routing. On the other side, we have the applications, an example one would be uh, appointment reminders. 
and if an point reminder arrives via SMS, it goes straight to there and the thing replies, routes it back. If it's a different a SMS aggregator in a completely different country, different protocol, it still arrives through the same route, application responds and comes back again. Now, all of these can live on separate machines, separate instances, um, even RabbitMQ can live in a cluster. So you really have a, uh, a design that's asynchronous, supports incredibly high throughput, um, and um, is definitely um, infinitely more scalable than the solution we init initially had that we started with. So everything is event-driven. There's no time or CPU cycles wasted waiting for data, um, and we achieve high I.O. So one of the big benefits of working with Twisted is that you can wait. Um, when you're coming from Django, you cannot afford to wait. Um, everything needs to be um, handled as soon as possible because the longer you keep your request open, the unhappier, unhappier your servers are going to be and um, requests are going to st start backing up and you're going to have unhappy customers. With Twisted, because it's asynchronous, you can wait for stuff and that gives us incredible uh, benefits. So one of them is the way we interface with some aggregators is that they want a synchronous response whenever they hit us with an SMS and they expect us to reply. In the actual HTTP response to their incoming post request, they want us to send the reply back. Now the benefit of having a completely asynchronous setup is that if you're async, um, it's quite easy to do still do sync on the edges while maintaining async on the inside. Whereas if you're completely sync, it's really difficult to do async stuff. So as the request comes in, we dispatch a message via RabbitMQ, ends up in our application, application responds to it, it and um, generates a response, routes it back to the transport. In the meantime, the transport has kept that HTTP connection open the whole time without, without breaking a sweat. There's no problem there. As soon as the message, outbound message arrives, the transport sees, okay, this one's for that request. I'm going to print that out to, or send it out via that request and close the connection. So because of Twisted, this gives us an incredible uh, flexible setup. In the same way, we have a transport that um, works on a mobile phone using an, Andro using an Android app. Um, what we can do here as an example is that the Android app Actually, it doesn't. Um, it's it's basically the same thing. So the the Android app sends us uh, SMSs that arrive on the phone, post it to our transport applications, generate the response. We intentionally keep here keep our um, connection open for I think it's half a second or something while the message comes back, which is more than enough because we never know if depending on the application there's going to be a response or not. So we're never quite sure if there is going to be a response. If there is, then we send it out via the phone again um, and um, then close the connection. So that allows us, even with simple mobile-based applications like Android apps, to still do um, messaging, ad hoc messaging across um, the African continent and in, a, in a very efficient way. So the downside of Twisted is that deferreds can be quite difficult to wrap your head around. Um, I've been working with it for a while. I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but it is um, coming to grips of working with something that you don't quite have yet. It can be a little bit confusing, um, especially when you're adding more than three callbacks to a deferred. It's like, it gets a little bit tricky getting a clear mental model. So inline callbacks are great to get started with, but can cause subtle problems. So if you have a bunch of, if you're trying to do HTTP requests, and you, all you do is a for loop, and then inside your for loop, you, you yield. So basically what you're doing is synchronous HTTP requests. In that case, inline callbacks is going to be a bad idea, and you need to start looking at deferred lists. So inline callbacks makes it easy to get started, but can cause problems elsewhere. Um, also benefit is that it's an incredible stable stack. It's also very old. But it also, it's they're very good with backwards, um, with not breaking the API, um, which has been a problem in the Node community. So um, the stack, if you're doing trying to do something with HTTP or XMPP, SMTP, all sorts of protocols, chances are someone has done it for Twisted or it's already part of Core Twisted. 
and Twisted gives you excellent tools to, to develop these, uh, to implement these protocols. Uh, the important question is how do you write tests? Um, tw because Twisted works with deferreds, your tests will return a deferred as well, and it's never. Um, so you, Twisted has a test runner that makes sure that your deferreds are fired and that your reactor is, is clean to make sure that all the deferreds you were expecting to fire actually fired within your test. Um, again, inside your tests, you can use inline callbacks, which is great to get started. Um, so one of the things we've been building, I'm almost at my at the end, is um, an application um, to give access to Wikipedia content from very low-end phones. Just to give you an example of what that code looks like, it's to see how we're using the yields. It's inline callbacks, session is yield get session, which is stored somewhere in the network. So we send a deferred whenever we get the session back, we resume, we check the state, if it's a new session, we send out a reply that says, reply to this message, what would you like to search Wikipedia for? If the session state is session resume, which means they're coming back, we check what they want to query Wikipedia for. We yield because we want to query Wikipedia, which is a network operation, and we don't want to wait for that. So we're going to send off a deferred again. When that deferred fires, we get the results back. We've, we render the response we want. We send a reply to the message um, with that response. Ooh, I forgot to include the response there. Um, so this is pretty much how, in Vumi, what an application looks like. And now, if this message arrives over USSD or SMS or GTalk, it doesn't matter. It doesn't care. All it handles is on a message object, which is a standardized message. So, sure. Do you mind if... One second. So, to I'm running at, towards the end of my time, but I just wanted to show this. You guys can try this now if you especially the ones who only have a phone that doesn't do anything but SMS voice, um, dial this number or add these two gtalk or gmail addresses to your gtalk list and you can interact with uh, the system as well. So this one, <coughs> the messages arrive over USSD protocol. It goes straight to your phone. And the response that the application generates goes straight to your phone. Um, you type in your answer and it gets routed back. Here, the, we're using the Google Talk transport, but again, it standardizes it to an internal message format, routes it through RabbitMQ, sends it to the same application, which generates a response. So it just shows how stuff works, um, the separation between transports and applications, and, and how Twisted allows us to do that, and um, yeah, still, well, do it without falling over, which is pretty awesome. Your question, sorry, let me go back, while people try it. The yield for the query Wikipedia. Yes. Uh, the thing that's reading the generator, how does it know not to do something with the deferred that it gets there? Sorry, coming back? Okay. Where you yield yeah. uh, self query Wikipedia? Yeah. The thing that's reading that generator, yeah. uh, elsewhere you're returning messages. Yeah. Uh, so, how does the thing that's reading that generator know that it mustn't? do something with that deferred? Well, so whenever this function is called, and, and this obviously, I mean, we're, we're subclassing an application worker. So whenever this function is called, because of the inline callbacks thing, you get a deferred back. And so you're constantly working with, with promises of some data that is to come. You can't really query for the value that it has at the moment. All you can say is, whenever that comes back, I want to do this with that bit of data. So all the way down, you're just working with deferreds. You're expecting a deferred back. If you want to do something with it, you add callbacks to it, um, and then leave it up to the reactor to fire those. Yep, yep. So it, it allows you to, like, Writing this with actual callbacks constantly would, um, certainly for me, it would make it much more difficult to follow what's going on. And the, in the inline callbacks really helps to get started, to wrap your head around how stuff works and what you want to do with it. Um, has anyone actually queried the service? So star 120, star 8864 hash. Um, yep. More questions? 
Somebody? Yes, Bryn. Simon, I was just wondering if you or anyone else in the room could comment on the overhead which inline callbacks in introduces as compared to building up uh, chains. I'm not sure if there is that much. I'm sure there's some state there. Can I give you a deferred? Was, I'm, yeah, I'm was, not quite I sure. Mainly, I was mainly wondering if anyone else in the room Yeah, had anyone else can answer that? But it's approximately, it's not significantly worse than uh, the um, than the regular uh, generator overhead, except if you generate a lot of, if you ha have a lot of exceptions. So um, because essentially the deep magic that has to go on uh, for preserving a traceback, because obviously, um, like if you're the if the reactor is calling you back with some data, then whatever your traceback is at that time really has nothing to do whatsoever with what you're actually doing. So your traceback is completely pointless. So in an effort to get you a real decent traceback, uh, that requires some fairly heavy lifting. Uh, but it's it's essentially for for a lot of people, it's turned out that it's more than fast enough. Uh, if you really really need to make it faster, then you can always rewrite it to the thirds. Uh, there was at some point someone who managed to basically write something that it's like inline callbacks based on the AST. So it like looks at the abstract syntax tree and basically rewrites it until it's uh, um, not no longer that, but like the the real thing with first. I don't think I don't know if that ever got finished though. Cool. More questions. Please. More questions. <laughs> Anyone? Cool. Well, it's. It's open source, BSD. Um, knock yourselves out. Look at the source code, um, and we're more than happy for people to help out and contribute um, to this project. So, if you have questions or if you have a project that you you think you might want to use messaging for, come have a chat. Uh, you can run it on your own server, or um, we can run and host the applications for you, and uh, we can look at uh, you re reusing some of our transports and existing countries and integration points there. Um, so, yep. thank you. Thank you, Simon.